Hello and welcome to Berean. My name is Tim Jolly. I serve as Berean Kids Pastor and it's such a joy for us to have you with us today. I specifically want to draw your attention to our website, BereanFamily.com, but put a forward slash prayer. One of the greatest things about being on staff here is that we gather weekly to pray for those in our community and for the needs that you might have. We would love to hear from you and know how we can pray for you. That's BereanFamily.com forward slash prayer. And now, today's sermon. I hope everybody's doing well. My name is Dan. I'm the lead pastor here. Hey, Kelly and I, like, um, we were watching this show as a storm chaser. Anybody ever watch the storm chaser shows? Um, is, there, is there a little bit in you when you watch those shows that you're kind of hoping that the car that they're driving gets like, you know, that might just be me. I was watching this one episode, and a guy, there was a, a mass, he was on the side of the road looking to film this tornado, and while he was waiting, there was like a massive car accident, all caught on tape. And the storm chaser then, recognizing the danger that the person in that car was, because now it had caught fire, abandoned what he was doing, and ran towards the fire. And it was this most dramatic scene of the guy who was once chasing a storm, doing something completely different, that now comes and saves the guy life. He rips him out of the car while it was on fire. It was pretty awesome. You know, there's something about the humanity and be will, being willing to take extra steps when we recognize somebody else's danger. Isn't that true? Sometimes you would do things that you would never think possible. You hear stories of people lifting up a car off of somebody and that some, so they can get pulled out or this almost extra strength, right? And I, I think what happens is the adrenaline gets going when we recognize just how much danger somebody's in and become willing to do whatever it takes when you normally wouldn't. I, I wonder follower of Jesus Christ, have we really recognized the danger an unbelieving world is in? Because if we do, if we really recognize that, if we really think about the danger that this unbelieving world is in, shouldn't that propel us to do whatever it takes to get the message of Jesus Christ to them? Man, He's saving a guy out of a burning car versus an awkward conversation. Church, if we're not already willing to do whatever it takes to bring the gospel of Jesus to our neighborhood, I, I hope and my prayer is today that when we leave, we'll be willing to do whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus. Today we're going to be in a, in a sermon, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2. This is actually the very first sermon I preached at Berean back in my candidating week, which is now like four and a half years ago. Is that crazy? Um, so it's a little bit of a recycle, <laughs> but here we are in Mark chapter 2. I did rewrite this, uh, I didn't go back to my old notes, but um, I have preached this text I would say, I'm probably going to set myself up to look really bad now. You're like, really? You've done it that many times and that's what you delivered? But I've preached this text, honestly, probably 40 or 50 or more times uh, in my ministry. And uh, it's, it's because it's like this event is probably my favorite event to talk about in scriptures. There's just so much there for us to see and to learn from, I think. So looking very much forward to that on a reduced clock with communion today. So I might start talking faster, all right? We're going to pray and then we're going to be in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a church family that we can come together, that we get to just be together as we worship and glorify you. This togetherness is something that you have modeled as our triune God. This perfect communion. And we, we strive for that unity. We strive to, be, um, uh, to, to love one another well. And God, as we do that, w would you help us to turn our gaze to the outside as well? To see a lost and dying world. To not be angry at people for the sin that they're in so much as desperate to get them out of it for your glory and for their good. God, would you cause us to be a people who's willing to do whatever it takes to bring people to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 2, verse 12 verses. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they, all were, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Here we are believing to be at Peter's house, which is in Capernaum, which sits on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is in northern Israel. It's, a, it's mostly a flat space where this, uh, where this home sits. Um, there's a Roman garrison here in Capernaum, um, it, so there's a lot of people in the area. Uh, because it was a home of Peter, it was likely a, a fishing village of sorts. So there's probably a lot of fishermen there. And, and I think we wrongfully assume uh, the fishermen as being blue collar and um, uh, maybe not as affluent. Uh, it's actually a fairly affluent community. This was a, a pretty important commodity, fish was. Um, and, and they probably traded them uh, at, at, to some degree. So some money, some resources here in this area, this fishing village of Capernaum. Uh, already in the Gospel of Mark, we've already studied through Jesus uh, doing some awesome things, healing a leper. Uh, already at this point now, um, he, he's, he's done all kinds of incredible things, casting out demons, uh, performing exorcism, casting out demons. He healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum, and now here we are, he's back at Peter's house. And there's a crowd that had gathered. Now, there really isn't any um, uh, surprise that a crowd had gathered, is there? Uh, given what Jesus had been up to already, it's understandable that everybody and their brother wants to come see for themselves what's going on, right? And we're going to dive into that. Uh, but first, first, I want to tell you our main idea for this morning is this. If we want to be used by Jesus to bring people to him, and I hope that we do, we must be willing to do whatever it takes. I want to talk a little bit about that crowd that was in that, uh, at that house that day. And our first point is this. The crowd had a lot in common with the crowds today. That crowd had a lot in common with crowds today. You see, people, humanity, while things have changed, cultures have changed, people are people. They, they had the same emotions and feelings that, that we do today. Some of the same struggles, even though they looked significantly different, they had then. Some of the relational issues, some of the work issues, they're just people, right? And people, people have a lot in common, and sometimes it even transcends time some, doesn't it? You know, it also transcends place. Uh, uh, I've been to, uh, a lot of you know I've been involved in professional hockey, and I've been able to watch a lot of professional hockey games at different sta stadiums throughout the United States. Well, can I tell you, it almost doesn't matter which stadium you're in. The crowds look and act almost identically to one another. That's probably not that big of a surprise, is it? Every one of those places are different, but every one is the same. Uh, the pregame uh, show is very similar no matter where you're at. The fans act um, nearly identical from one place to another. In fact, go out of hockey, go to a football game, a baseball game, a basketball game, and this is true. Any pro sport in America, and you're going to likely to find probably some drunken belligerent people, right? Have you ever been to a, a Browns game and not seen that? <laughs> right? There's a joke there, I'm sure. I'm just going to keep moving. You're going to see a dad with some of his kids sitting there taking in the game. There's always going to be a guy or two yelling at the referee or the umpire, right? Is anybody else that guy? <laughs> 
Uh, there's going to be a group of young guys or teenagers that mess around the whole game and barely pay any attention. Uh, this same group of people are at every game. Uh, I want you to notice, I want you to notice in our text today that when Christ is preached, there are some similarities with the crowd then as there are now. Listen again to verses 1 to two, one and 2. It says, And when he had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And when he was preaching the word to them, I'm sorry, and he was preaching the word to them. And we're going to come back in just a minute and talk more about the makeup of the crowd. I want you to notice what Jesus was doing here at this home. What was he doing? He was preaching the word to them. Uh, the word is this Greek word logos, and we will see it used throughout the gospel, referencing the scriptures and the one fulfilling the scriptures. Listen to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's the same Greek word for word as what Jesus was preaching so the word of God was here preaching the word of God, and in doing so, he was affirming the truths in the word of God. John 10.35 says, scriptures cannot be broken. Scriptures cannot be broken. Friends, I want you to have all the confidence in the world that the word of God, the, 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 the inspired word of God that we have today is reliable. I want you to have that confidence Listen to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Uh, this word scriptures here, oftentimes we, we, we think that in the New Testament it's limiting it to what was said in the Old Testament, but that's not the case. Listen to what Peter has to say about Paul's writings in 2 Peter 3.16. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. See, Peter even knew that this, this New Testament that we had was also the word of God, and he likened it to the Old Testament. Now I want to move back to the crowd who was there as the word of God was preaching the word of God? And what does that crowd have in common with any crowd when the word is preached today? There, there were people who were there that were already followers of Jesus, right? Uh, we know of at least four uh, uh, called disciples who are there. Uh, I'm thinking by this time, Peter's mother-in-law is likely a believer, right? Since she was healed. So there were people who had been healed, people who already go I'm following him. I've already decided I'm following him. So followers of Jesus that were there, they were hanging on every one of his words as he spoke, as they already committed to following him. There was also in the group people who were there who must have been just curious about who this Jesus is. And maybe they heard about these healings, maybe they heard about these teachings, and they want to come see for themselves. And as such, they're hanging on every word that the Word of God is preaching. And then finally, we see the scribes. There were, there were those who were there who were opposed to him, wanting to catch him saying something that they could exploit. Can I tell you, almost every instance where Christ has preached today, in 2024, those th same three groups exist. Maybe they are in this room. Those who are already following Jesus, of course we have so many of us that are, are in that camp. Some who have heard about Jesus and they've come to hear from themselves. Some who are drug here kicking and screaming. And they're opposed to the gospel message. I want you to hold on to that for when we come back and we see what God does at the end here. Anytime the word of God is preached, we can likely find these same three groups of people. And as I preach this morning, I just want you to answer for yourself, which one of those three groups do you identify with today? Our main idea is if we want to be used by Jesus to bring people to him, we must be willing to do whatever it takes. My second point is this. We all need him. It's the power of faithful friends. There is a power in faithful friends. 
Uh, I, I had this uh, trip I needed to go on with Elijah, uh, my almost 19-year-old son now. I think he was 12 years old or 11 at the time. And I was rushing to get uh, this building built for our, uh, it was a goat enclosure. Uh, we were living in Alaska. This, it was snowing like crazy, and I'm trying to get a roof on this thing. It's about midday, and the flight's taking off that night. So I'm trying to get this thing done, working as fast as I can, and I'm using a, 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 um, a, a nail gun, right? And this, this particular gun was a friend of mine's, and um, it, it had this thing that it would do randomly. It would shoot two nails when you pressed it once. Well, that's not always good, as I found out. So I'm working over my head, and I hit it once, boom, and I go to pull back, and it shoots again right into my hand. So there's a picture. No, I'm kidding. I should have. I should have done the picture. That would have been great. Um, by the way, I went to the, when I went, this is nothing to do with it, but I go to the hospital, and like everybody and their brother just come in. They don't even look at me. They don't say, how are you doing? Are you okay? They're like, let me see your hand. <laughs> they all thought it was the coolest thing, this nail sticking up out of my hand. And, and also kind of interesting, you know what it took, takes two people to pull one of those things out? Yeah, one person to hold your hand down, the other person to, anyways, I'm pretty sure they both charged me too, and that's a little bit insulting. But while I, was, while I was at the hospital, by the time I got back, I already had friends at my house finishing that roof for me because they knew I had to leave that night. Man, uh, for them, they didn't, seem like, they didn't think it was that big of a deal, but they came and they helped me in my time of need. Friends, there is a power in having faithful friends. I hope all of us have faithful friends. Listen to verses 3 and 4. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. I want you to again think about this scene. Jesus is teaching. There, there are people that are there. They're already agitated. They're listening for him to, to, to slip up so they can prove themselves right. There are people there that are hanging on every word because they've heard and they want to see from themselves. And there are people there just going, this is amazing, who have already decided to follow him. But the people, it's packed, it's pressed in together. I want you to use your imagination and almost imagine that you're in that house. Packed in together, even out the door. Likely people out the windows looking in. A crowd surrounded, like a swarm of bees around this house. And that's the scene that we have that these guys find. Everybody pressed together. Actually, I have a house, a picture. There you go. Uh, that's the remains of what they believe is Peter's house. There's actually like a courtyard in between. Um, there would have been flat roofs, by the way. That's important. Uh, with a thatching roof, um, if you're wondering how they pulled that roof out. But anyways, I want you to imagine now. You could, to put that picture back up real quickly. I want you to imagine now that that's, that's actually a, a completely finished building. You see the flat land. You see the the Sea of Galilee in the distance. I want you to imagine being those four guys, these four friends of the paralytic. Think about their motivation. Now, I've said this every time I preach this message, and I still believe it's true. These four guys absolutely had to be teenagers in my mind because nobody else would have been this annoying, right? <laughs> you pick up your, four, your friends. There's four of you. You pick up your friend, and you begin walking. You see that house. And you see that the house is completely packed with people. You're walking, by the way, because you either saw for yourself or you've heard what Jesus could do for your friend. And, and as somebody in this friend group says, listen, we don't know the paralytic's name. We'll call him Bill. They're like, Bill needs to get to Jesus immediately. That wasn't a shot at Pastor Bill, by the way. <laughs> I just, I was looking for a name and I went this way. Bill, all right. So they, they, bring, they bring their friend to Jesus, they're carrying him, and they get up to this house and it's completely packed full of people that you can't even get to the doorway to get them in. Now, I want you to imagine, this is extra biblical, imagine the conversation that might have taken place on their way. There had to have been, there had to have been at least one of them going, guys, it's packed right now, let's just go back and we'll, we'll come check out tonight. We'll see if we can come back later when the crowd, when the crowd dies down. Let me ask you, would that be a reasonable thing? Yeah, I, I could find myself saying that in that, in that period of time. I love, though, that one or more of them said, no, 
No, our friend, Bill has been sick long enough. There's Jesus in that house and he can heal him. I know he can heal him. I've seen what he can do in people's lives. We're not going to wait another day. We're not going to wait another minute. I don't care if we have to push our way into that house. We're bringing our sick friend to the feet of Jesus. The power of faithful friends. The power of faithful friends. And think about how this ends up playing out. They can't get into the house. So what do they do? Well, let's just go up on the roof. Uh, again, you imagine. You're sitting there listening, hanging on every word for whatever reason. You're either opposed to him and you're wanting to catch him. You're seeking and you're just curious what's going to be said next. Or you're already a follower. So the silence that must have been in that room is they're just listening to the rabbi teach. Then you hear something. And then you see something. There's light now coming in right above you. I imagine it probably got a little bit quiet as some thatching started to fall down on everybody as they pulled that roof apart. And then what would you be thinking when all of a sudden you see a stretcher and a person on it being dropped down through the roof? What an incredible scene. I love this historical event. I love what happens that these four faithful friends have decided that they are willing to do whatever it takes. Do you think that might have been awkward for them? Do you think they didn't realize that some people would be angry with them? The Bible doesn't record it, but I almost have to imagine somebody in that crowd would have looked up and said, what on earth do you think you're doing? But they continued on because their mission was so important. Their friend was sick. He was paralyzed, and they had enough of it. They said, today is going to be the day that that ends. We're going to do whatever we have to do to get him to the feet of Jesus. I love what they do here. They drop their friend. The best place in the world to be dropped, at the feet of Jesus. I also wonder, was the paralyzed guy willing in all this? (laughs) It doesn't say one way or another, does it? That guy might have been the whole time going, where are we going? Guys, guys. Why are we going up on the... Guys, what is happening? We don't know. Do you have friends in your life that are willing to do and say hard things to bring you back to Jesus? Because as the song says, we are prone to wander, aren't we? Do you have those faithful friends in your life that say, no, 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 no. We need to go back. We need to return to Jesus. Listen, if you don't have those friends, you need them. How about this? Are you one of those four? Are you one of those four friends willing to do whatever it takes for the sake of your friend? I hope so. I hope we are the kind of friends that would push through the awkwardness in order to bring others closer to Jesus. Our main idea is this. If we want to be used by Jesus to bring people to him, we must be willing to do whatever it takes. My third and final point is this. Jesus displays his power to save through his power to heal. We see this come up over and over in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, there's, there's a fight coming up. I don't know if anybody's been paying any attention to. Uh, Mike Tyson and this guy, Jake Paul. Anybody knew about this fight that's coming? <clears throat> I'm just curious. No, I'm not going to even ask the question. So, so Mike Tyson is this heavyweight champion who's now, I think, like 56 or 58 years old. Does anybody know? He's old. All right. If you're older than that, I'm sorry, but don't be a boxer. All right. He's old for a boxer. I'm going to get hate mail for that one. So, so right now, before the fight, we see what happens in almost any kind of fight. There's a lot of talking happening, right? There's just a lot of talking. This Jake Paul thinks he's going to go in and just wipe the floor with Mike Tyson. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. We don't know. Uh, there's lots of that kind of talking going on. There's other talking going on in our world right now. There's this election coming up in November. Did you guys know about that? (laughs) Every presidential election, I don't care if it's your hero or your villain, they all make promises they know they will not keep, right? Or they don't even have the authority to keep. We see that all the time. You know, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make people do this X, Y, or Z. I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to get political here. And then they know that they would need the Congress and the, and the Senate in order to do such a thing, and they're never going to have that, so it's just empty promises. We see that all the time. I think we're almost used to empty promises when it comes out of the political world, aren't we? Yeah, we are. 
I want to turn our attention back to our text here, verse 5 through the first part of verse 12. It says this, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. You see, this crowd in some cases may have been used to empty promises. There were lots of people claiming to be the Messiah to where they started growing cynical and skeptical probably and even rightfully so. Jesus didn't just say your sins are forgiven. He backed up that authority and that power, didn't he? I love, by the way, this payoff for the four friends that were willing to do whatever it takes. Did you notice it says that when Jesus saw their faith, plural? I love that. I think Jesus was honoring their effort to do whatever it takes to bring their paralyzed friends to him. And Jesus first heals that paralyzed man in the, in the place of greatest need. You know, I'm sure everybody in that room thought that man's greatest need was to be able to walk. Jesus knew better. There was a far greater need. Listen, friends, we, we, we want to pray for you and your, and your physical needs. We absolutely do, and we will. We, we would love to anoint you with oil and pray over you and ask God to heal you physically. But, friends, that is a far cry less important than your spiritual need. One is temporary, one is eternal. Jesus heals him in the area of his greatest need first. The man's physical healing was to demonstrate Jesus' ability to heal spiritually. We see that in the text, that you may know. I will say this a lot in this series, but physical healing is only temporary. We should seek it out for sure, but it is far less important than our spiritual healing. My question for you this morning, or one question for you this morning is this. Have you received the spiritual healing that comes through Jesus? Are you a follower of Christ? One day when we leave this world, are you going to be received into heaven as a beloved child because of the shed blood of Christ on your behalf? Is he your Lord of your life? If you don't have that confidence, man, I want you to have that confidence. I want you to have that confidence. When God moves in the lives of those around us, there is only one appropriate response. Back to the three groups of people. There were people there that already followed Jesus. People in that room that were curious and seeking him out. And people who were opposed to them, to him and his message. I find it interesting that the text indicates that all three groups had the same response. When Jesus healed this man and he got up, listen to verse 12, the end of verse 12. So that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Did you know that your testimony will amaze those who know you? Those people, even if they're opposed to God who knew you before you became a follower of Jesus. Or if they will not say it, maybe, maybe they'll say it, maybe they won't. They are amazed at the change that's taken place in your life. Use your story. Use your story because after all, it's not your story. It's his story that he's working through you. The people around you already notice it. Use it. Say it. Talk about it. Point people to Jesus doing whatever it takes to get them there. That's what we absolutely must do. The believers glorified God. The seekers glorified God. And the scribes in the story even glorified God. If you want to be used by Jesus to bring people to him, we must be willing to do whatever it takes. Ultimately, Jesus was willing to do whatever it takes to save you, wasn't he? Even death on the cross. 
We're going to conclude, and I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come back up on stage with me because we'll have one more song of praise after, the, after my conclusion here. I have to ask myself the question, am I willing to do whatever it takes? I don't know that I always am if I'm honest. Sometimes I'm caught, caught unaware, off guard. Sometimes my first response isn't the correct one. We have to be aware that, that this world that we're in, we have this, this set amount of time, and, and it's a short period of time, and every conversation could be one with eternal significance. And, and for us to be re- prepared for that, we must be prayed up. We need to be praying regularly throughout the day. God, help me to not sin against you. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, give me your eyes to see those who are around me, your words to speak, and the courage that comes from your indwelling Holy Spirit to speak them. That needs to be a constant prayer in our lives if we're going to be faithful. Sometimes I think that there are some things that stop us from being like one of the four friends. We're afraid to face the crowd. There's too many people here right now, guys. This is going to be awkward. Let's come back later. Maybe you don't feel qualified. Maybe you don't feel qualified. Who am I? Who, who am I to share anything? Man, I, I, I mess up all the time. I, I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Who am I to share? Maybe we don't want to be perceived as pushy. I don't want to push my faith onto somebody else. Friends, that's wrong thinking. And sometimes we're just unfortunately complacent and somewhat apathetic. Maybe sometimes we even doubt, does he really have the power to save my friend? Could that even be a thing? May I remind you, dear Christian brother and sister, you do not need to be an expert. You need to be willing. You do not need to be an expert. You do not need a seminary degree to bring your friends to Jesus. You don't have to have all of the answers being ready to look smart in a moment's notice. You have to be faithful. You have to be willing. I love the story of how D.L. Moody came to Christ. I've shared it. A million other pastors have shared it. I don't really care. <laughs> He's going to a small group or a Bible study and the Sunday, at a Sunday school. And the Sunday school teacher was getting annoyed because he couldn't really get anything out of this young D.L. Moody. So he decides, I'm going to go visit him at his place of work. And he was a shoe salesman. So the guy walks up to D.L. Moody. And, th- and it's the whole way, I'm sure, thinking, what am I going to say to him? How am I going to present the gospel? The best he could muster as he was getting fitted for a pair of shoes D.L., I want you to come to Jesus. It's the best he did. Walked away thinking, man, that was a lousy shot at evangelism. What happened? Of course, D.L. Moody becomes a follower of Christ. Preaches all over the United States and in Europe. Tens of thousands, hundreds, maybe millions of people, either directly or indirectly, are followers of Jesus Christ because of the ministry of D.L. Moody. And it started with a faithful Sunday school teacher. Friends, are you willing to be faithful? Not perfect, not eloquent, not articulate, faithful. Because that's what we've been called to do. You have been commissioned by God to be Holy Spirit-filled ambassador to a lost and hurting world. Key, Holy Spirit-filled. Can't do it on our own, friends. But we can do it in the power of Christ, in the power of his Holy Spirit who indwells us. Use what you have. You have circles of influence. You have time. You have your home. You have the soccer field if you're a young family. You have places where you can talk. You can invite someone here. And you can share your story. And you can share God's story. By the way, your story is just as miraculous as what happened to this paralytic in Mark chapter 2. At the end of the day, I want you to know this, that Jesus is exalted when we do whatever it takes to bring those around us to him. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this example that these four had given us. We thank you that you, you, the, their, their faithfulness was paid off in an ultimate fashion, that their friend, not only could he walk again, but his, his eternity was taken care of, that he was healed spiritually. God, would you help us 
to be motivated from this story. Would you help us to leave here being willing to do whatever it takes to bring our friends to you? We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.